the concern today is the scripture doctrine of inspiration. inspiration of scripture. This is our burden this morning. And it is an exceedingly significant, very, very significant uh, subject to be dealing with at this stage of our theological learning for the reasons that I will outline in a moment. Now, before we engage ourselves with the doctrine of inspiration, let us give context to this lecture. Do you understand the word context? The environment in which we are doing this lecture. Okay, that's, that's what we mean by context, environment. Um, yesterday, we labored the idea that scripture, holy scripture, the Bible, is very much a human book. You remember that? So we were talking about the humanity of the Bible. And at that point we were anxious, really determined, to make the point, even prove the point, that you cannot over-spiritualize the Bible. That you've got to look at the Bible as you would look another book. Now that's a dangerous statement to make, I know, but my meaning will become clear in a moment. And we began to see the layout and organization of the Bible, that it was written in the context of human history. And that history, as we saw yesterday, spans a period of between 1,500 to 1,600 years. That's a period. So the Bible is a decidedly, convincingly, evidently a historical book. It's a proper record of history, even human history. <coughs> But we also observed that though scripture comes from God, but scripture comes from God through human beings. Is that correct? And that in fact, those human beings numbered 40 different persons, 40. Isaiah had a personality and Paul had a personality and Amos had a personality, and Luke had a personality, and Moses had a personality, and Peter, and Hosea, and John, and Habakkuk. I mean, you've got 40 different authors in Scripture. Again, talking about the humanity of the Bible. But we also say, as you read the Bible, you find that Holy Scriptures covers quite a wide area of geographical locations, and a variety, uh, for that matter. Portions of it are set in Palestine proper, that's the Middle East where Judea is. Parts of it are set in Europe, Rome, for example, Italy. Parts of it are set in Persia. Parts of it in Babylon. Parts of it in Egypt. So you've got those different geographical locations. Are those places on earth? They are places on earth. But we also made the point that as you read the Bible, uh, we understand that it came to us not in some kind of angelic, angelic or heavenly language, but that it came to us in essentially three human languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. It's essentially the way the Bible came to us. And then we see a record in the Bible 
of God dealing with people. For example, we read in Exodus, I think, chapter 18, did you not? Uh, where God tells uh, Moses to fight the Amalekites, and as long as his hands were held up, they were winning. When his hands were down, they were losing. And so they brought stones to support his, him in sitting, and uh, Joshua and the other guy are lifting up his hands in support, and they win. And God says, write this down, because I want it to be remembered. So that the scripture is born out of ordinary human circumstances. Now, we say there are two implications that come out of that kind of reflection, that kind of discussion. The first is that we understand then that the Bible is a very human book. That's basic. But we also take a second <laughs> lesson out of that, and we say that the Bible then is a very sympathetic book. That is to say, we can relate to the Bible. We can understand the Bible because it is born within our human circumstances. It's not like the Quran, it's not like the Bhagavad Gita of the Hindus, <coughs> and so on, or uh, the Book of Mormons by Joseph Smith of the Church of the Latter day Saints, also called the Mormons. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when we insist, I want you to be careful here because I transition to the next lecture here. When we insist, that the Bible is a human book written by human beings through human languages within human geography and culture and circumstances and events then the question comes if these human beings are fallible the word fallible means they can make mistakes okay we talk about the word fallible means able to make mistakes. Infallible is God, means he cannot make a mistake. So once we insist that the Bible is human, then the danger comes. Is it then a fallible book? Is it a book that can contain mistakes? For example, did Isaiah forget something? God told him, for example, you know that we human beings forget. Was there something that God told him that Isaiah forgot? Now, one of our brothers here was asking the question then, what do we say concerning those extra canonical books? Extra canonical books are simply books that are beyond the 66. All right? What do we say of those? I did introduce to you the concept of Gnosticism. These people who pretended, I don't say pretend, but believed that they had extra information that was not contained in the 66 books of the Bible. And they came up, for example, with the Gospel of Barnabas, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, for example. What do we say of that? How do we respond to Muslims who say that, in fact, the Bible is good, the 39 books of the Old Testament are good, except the New Testament scriptures, which, as they say, were corrupted by people like the Apostle Paul. So that in the New Testament, we have mistakes, they say. We have errors there, we have contradictions. How do we respond to people like that? And, and they will say, look, the Bible was written by human beings. <laughs> Surely, we must expect that there was some slippage of information, some forgetfulness somewhere. So how do we respond to that while maintaining that the Bible is a human book? Remember we say God did not dictate in other words, God didn't stand in front of Isaiah and told him, take a book and say, write, I the Lord, I the Lord, I'm your God. And there was not that. That was in the process by which the Bible came to us. There's a sense, and I will show you this in a moment, there's a sense in which revelation, scripture, the words of God, we are very much a part of Isaiah. 
So that if you read Jeremiah, for example, Jeremiah would say, For the word of the Lord was like unto me, fire shut up in my bones. It was part of me. What do we say of Luke? No, we read Luke yesterday. Yes, in chapter 1. And Luke makes the point to Theophilus, to whom he's writing. He says, I did my diligence, I applied myself as Dr. Luke to investigate these things. Well, Luke, were you able to interview everybody? Was there something, a sentence, a word, a nuance, a body language, which somebody told you, which you forgot to record? If you forgot, if there was something, then how can we be sure that this is all of God's word? You get what I'm saying? Once we insist on humanity, the question comes of fallibility or otherwise of sacred scripture. Are you following the difficulty? I'm simply trying to draw the context in which we must discuss the doctrine of inspiration. So the question of fallibility or otherwise of scripture arises as soon as we raise the matter of humanity of scripture. But there is a second problem and that is more immediate to my address to you this morning. And this is the second problem. How can I, who is a Bible teacher here at Wisdom Training Center, School of Ministry and Theology, how can I then be sure that what I'm teaching you from the pages of Holy Scripture is not fanciful imagination of Isaiah? Some scientists are saying, no, the words of Scripture are simply fertile imaginations of Jewish people. And we've been sold a lie, they say. How can I be sure then that what I'm telling you is true? Let's graduate that question. Let's take it to you. You are a pastor. You are a Bible teacher. How sure are you that what you're telling people is God's word? It's not the corruption of Paul. Let's paint a third picture. We are saved by hearing the words of God. Isn't it? For Romans chapter 10, verse 17, tells us faith comes by how? Hearing. And it is by hearing the words of Christ. I have to hear the preaching of the Bible in order for me to develop faith in the Christ that is being preached. And by that faith, I am being saved. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if I am not sure whether the words that I'm hearing are true, it, can my faith be legitimate? It cannot be. Those three things that are painted in your hearing are to bring us to one question, and one question only. The doctrine of inspiration of scripture addresses this question, can we fully trust the Bible? That is the question. Can we fully trust the Bible? Can we with confidence, with conviction, with no doubt whatsoever in our minds, say the Bible is God's very words? Can we? It's an issue. Now, that question, like I have just described, goes to a number of issues that are pertinent to our existence as Christian people. It affects whether I can actually believe I'm saved or not. Because I'm saved, pursuant, following the words of Scripture. If they cannot be trusted, my salvation cannot be trusted. So this is a profound issue. It's really an important issue, isn't it? But if I cannot trust the words of the Bible, what business do I have talking to you about the Bible? Let me, this is for the sake of our international audience as well, because I think this problem is very much in the West. This is in Europe and America. Preachers preach the Bible as if it is a set 
of suggestions. Oh, there are two ways of looking at this. And I suggest to you, brothers and sisters, that God would like us, God would like us to do this. <laughs> because in Europe particularly, and in America, it is considered somehow arrogant to insist that this is absolute truth. What I'm telling you is the absolute truth, and there is no other truth than the Bible, that this is arrogant. This is intolerant, we are told in the West. But you see, the reason why preachers in the West, pastors in the West, are capitulating. Capitulating means they are changing tune. They are softening ground. And preaching as if the Bible is a set of suggestions. As if the Bible is an alternative way. Among other ways, goes to the question of whether they can fully trust that the Bible is God's word. Ladies and gentlemen, if the Bible is truly God's word, then there is no suggestion about it. It is a thus saith the Lord. And all hearing a thus saith the Lord must simply toe the line. No question about it. So a pastor worth his name, a preacher worth his calling, cannot present the Bible as a set of suggestions. This is God's holy, infallible, fully trustworthy word. Now, the 16th century reformers that I have here, two in particular in my mind, I'm talking of Martin Luther. Martin Luther spoke of the preacher in very lofty terms, and I wish the present would understand those words. We understand that position. Martin Luther said, if the preacher of the Bible should faithfully exposit scripture, faithfully open up scripture in context and explain it within its original meaning and context and be faithful to its application, Martin Luther says, it is as if majesty itself, and by majesty he means almighty God, we are standing in front of the people and speak. The same was said by John Calvin, who said, in fact, if the preacher of the gospel should be faithfully expositing the word of God, it is Christ himself speaking at that time. Christ himself. Now, I've been teaching in this church here for the last few months about the Christ of our salvation, and for the last, I think, four weeks or so, no, two, three weeks, I've been preaching about the offices of Christ. And last Sunday, the last Sunday I was here, I spoke about the prophetic office of Christ. And I said, Christ continues to exercise his prophetic office in the church in two ways. One, externally. Externally, through the preaching of his word. But does Christ stand on Sunday platforms every Sunday? It is his servant who looks at scripture and faithfully, fearfully, brings it to God's people. And at that time, it is Christ himself who in fact is speaking to his people. So we can only have confidence in our preaching ministry, we can only preach the way God wants us to preach if we can fully trust the Bible. So the doctrine of scripture inspiration is absolutely essential to our understanding as Christian people. We must believe it. The Bible is not just a human book, but that, in fact, it was inspired by God. Now, within the doctrine of inspiration of Scripture, and I'm making a second, maybe third point here, within the doctrine of inspiration of Scripture would be found two basic questions. Now, I say, the larger question is, can we trust the Bible? Are we coming together? That's the larger question. And want to see if we can. But there are two questions within that bigger question. They all have to do with inspiration. Question number one. Within that bigger question of can we trust the Bible, there are two other questions. Question number one. Is it really from God? 
Is the Bible really from God? <laughs> you know, by the way, one of the things that surrounds um, the whole question of the Quran, right, is the question of inspiration, by the way. Because scholars have debated whether in fact Muhammad had from God. Now, when he was in the caves in Arabia at a place called Mount Hira, Muhammad received his revelation. And we know, for example, that Muhammad was epileptic. He had a disease called epilepsy, kifafa, okay? He was epileptic. So this day he is fasting and meditating in the caves of Hira, and he goes into a fit. Now, we don't know. Was he suffering an epilepsy? Or was it some kind of a spirit that got into him? All right? And then it is during this trance that is supposed to have received this revelation on Islam. Now, Muhammad coming out of the cave, himself doubted whether he had received a revelation from God. Because he said, I, I fear I am being tormented by demons. That's what he said himself. I fear I am being tormented by demons. Now, was it epilepsy? Was it demons? And then he runs home to his wife, Khadija. And Khadija tells him, ah, don't worry, you are a prophet of God. And that's where he finds, finds his idea that I could actually be a prophet. <laughs> so, is it God? Is it demons as himself fear? Or is it epilepsy, for example? In other words, is it really from God is a question of the source of scripture. The source of scripture. Where do scriptures come from? Do they come from the mind of Isaiah, Paul, Amos, Job, Moses, Nehemiah, Luke, John, Habakkuk, Timothy? I mean, where, where, do the, where, where do the scriptures come from? What is the origin <coughs> of scripture? The origin of scripture. Is it really from God? Now, ladies and gentlemen, once we answer that question, either way, but particularly if we can determine, if we can arrive at a conclusion that scriptures actually have their origin, have their source in God, then there is a second question that arises. There is a second question that arises. And the second question has to do with, it may very well, now let me, let me just give a demonstration here. It may very well have come from God, the source may have been God, but in the process of its coming to us, something may have happened in order to change it, in order to contaminate it, in order to spoil it. Are you with me? So the source may be correct, but there could have something happened here. Now, again, let, let, me, let me give this illustration. I am going to speak to you in English, okay? I want you to speak in Swahili to him, the same things that I've told you, all right? And then you, being spoken to in Swahili, I want you to speak to him in Luya, <laughs> all right? The Christological development of redemption is very much predicated on the sole authority of New Testament revelation. Would you please say that to him in Swahili? Ah, you see? <laughs> there is a problem. By the way, I use big words deliberately. Some of those words will not be found in Swahili. For example, Christological. You will have to explain the word, but there is no equivalent in Swahili. Now, well, some things will be lost between me and you. Okay? From me to you, though the source is me, but for them to get to you, you will lose some, 
By the time you pass it to him, there will be some loss because even Swahili to to what? So English to Swahili, there is a loss there. Then Swahili to Luya, there will be another. Is that what happened with the Bible? People can accept. They came from God. But by the time they reached us, <laughs> some things happened. That is a process we call transmission, and we'll deal with it in a moment. Okay? Was the transmission of scripture without fault? So we are not in the doctrine of inspiration, we are not just looking at source and origin, but we're also looking at the process of transmission. Because remember, the big question is, can we have confidence in the Bible? <laughs> so these are the two questions we want to deal with, all right? We want to deal with these two questions in the next few minutes and then uh, praise God that we can move forward with the doctrine of scripture inspiration. Now can I say, if you can't have confidence in the Bible, it will show in the way you preach. It will show. It will show. But if I know this is God's word, ladies and gentlemen, my preaching changes. <coughs> so let us deal with the question of source first of all, right? <laughs> question of source. What is the source of scripture? Is it from some demonic influence? Is it from some epileptic feet? <laughs> is it, for example, uh, from the mind, the fertile mind of uh, Isaiah? For example, we have a, a very interesting fella in this country, calls himself a prophet, right? Moves around, but he has a lot, a lot of imagination, this guy. A lot of imagination. And people believe him, isn't it? Well, those things don't come from, they come from his mind. Things can come from your mind and look like they are scripture. What is the source of scripture? What is the origin of Holy Scripture? Now, for that conversation, I want us to turn very quickly now to Peter's second letter. The second letter of the Apostle Peter. This is where, actually no, it is actually first, second Timothy, no, not Peter, second Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter three. I want you to read with me verse 14, verse 15, verse 16, and verse 17. Are you there? So verse 14. But as for you, Paul is speaking to Timothy. He says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. Uh -huh. Knowing from whom you learned it. Did you see that? It is important to know the source of your land. You know what you know. Where do you get it from? It's essential. That's what Paul tells Timothy here. Continue firmly the things which you have believed, knowing from whom you learned them. <laughs> it wasn't a madman on the streets. It wasn't, it wasn't some great prophet who came around. It wasn't some super apostle walking around. No, no, no. From whom did you learn what you learned? Let's keep going. Just want you to notice that. Verse 15. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then here comes the big idea. Here comes the big idea. Verse 16. All scripture. How many scripture? 
all scripture, not part of scripture, but all scripture. Not some parts of Luke and some parts of John, but all scripture. Not just the Old Testament, not just the New Testament, but all scripture. If you're going to believe one part of scripture, Paul is saying, you must believe all of it. You can't cherry pick. You can say, ah, I believe what Luke wrote, but I don't believe what Paul wrote. See, that's what the Muslims are trying to tell us. Take some, leave some. No, the Torah, the Nabi, the Injil, uh, Zabur, these are good, but not the New Testament. No, Paul says all scripture. And the word scripture there is the Greek word graphe. Okay? Graphe. <coughs> graphe. And this word simply means writing. Okay? Scripture, graphe, writings. So it is not what somebody dreamed. No, that's not written. You understand what I'm saying? It's not what somebody says, I was, as, I, I, was, I was meditating and a voice came. No, no, no. Graphe means writing. All writings. And I remind you what I said yesterday. Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, three times is tempted by the devil. He gave us an example. By responding how? It is written. Graphic, graphic, graphic. So all graphic, scripture, graphic, what's the next word? Is breathed out by God. I want you to stop there. We will continue the rest of the scripture. So he says all writings that we find in sacred scripture, the word he uses is Breathed out. Now, in the Greek, now did I tell you that the New Testament is written in the Greek language? Did I say that? In the Greek, that construction of words, breathed out, is the Greek word, theo nustos. That's the Greek word. For breathed out. Breathed out. All scripture breathed out by God. That tells us about the source, about the origin of sacred scripture. The origin is on the mind of Isaiah. The origin is the breath of God. Now, some of your Bibles will use the word inspiration here. It's inspired. I do know men like Benjamin Warfield have disputed that word and they have said perhaps this is not the word we should use. In fact, they say we should use the word expiration. Now, unfortunately, in today's English, expiration means gone bad, isn't it? Expire, gone bad. But this simply means breathe out. X is out. So Benjamin Hoffman says we should use the word inspiration. We should use the word expiration. So it's a complicated argument. I don't even think we should think about it. Theonustos breathed out by God. Now, brothers and sisters, I say for us to form speech for us to form words there is a combination of two things that are necessary in the formulation of speech now I want you to hold your tongue eh? transmit to me <laughs> you can't because your tongue 
is not moving. Is that correct? For you to form words, your tongue must move. Now help. Hold your breath. Speak to me while holding your breath. You can't even see. <laughs> In other words, without the tongue moving, there cannot be words. Without you breathing, there cannot be words. Does that make sense? So for there to be speech, there has to be the tongue modulating breath. <sighs> my breath is being played by my tongue. What comes out are words. When scripture says that all graphene, all scripture is breathed out by God, it doesn't simply mean no, no. It means God spoke scripture. There was breath, and if you will, anthropomorphically, modulated by the tongue of God, anthropomorphically, and what came out are words. <coughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, who spoke scripture? Thank you. That's the meaning of the apostle here. He spoke scripture. <laughs> scripture have their origin in God Himself, not a man. Breathed out by God. I'll talk about this some more. When I talk about the autographs of scripture. And so Paul says then that because the source is God, because the origin is God, Paul says therefore that the scriptures are profitable. Had they not been from God, they wouldn't have been this profitable. But because they are from God, they are profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. It says verse 17 that the men of God may be complete. Only scriptures can complete us in that respect. Equipped for every good work. Breathed out by God. Theonustos. Theonustos. The word Theo then has two words. That word means God. Theos. Nus. Numa means breath. Right? Numa. Same one for breath, spirit, wind. In the Greek it is Numa. It's spelled like Pneuma. So if you say Theonustos, Theopneustos, we would say it is Theonustos, God breathed. Coming out from God Himself. You know, the prophets of the Old Testament had this saying. Thus saith the Lord. They didn't say, I think God is saved. They didn't say that. They never said Thus saith the Lord. Isaiah 28, verse 9, 10, and 11. And the word of the Lord came to us, line upon line, precept upon precept, a little here, a little there. Jesus in Luke chapter 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of what? Theonustos, the mouth of God. The Gospel of John chapter 6 and verse 63. John 6 and 63. The flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that gives life. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit Numa and their life. Their spirit, Numa, and their life. So the origin of scripture is God. That is the contention of scripture. That is the contention of the Apostle Paul here. That as we come face to face with the sacred writings of scripture, we are coming face to face with that product which comes directly from God, not from some prophet, not from some hallucination 
not from some misguided soul, not from some fanciful imagination, fertile imagination of a particular person. So if I know that the Bible is from God himself, ladies and gentlemen, I present it with the authority of God himself. But that's one aspect of the question, isn't it? There's the other aspect of the question. And that's a more difficult one. How then the humanity of the Bible comes to tally, to gel, to merge with its divinity. This is what we call divinity of the Bible, isn't it? That the Bible is divine. Divine why? Because it comes from God. You have a question like that. Explain why the Bible is a divine book. Because the origin of scripture is the onustos. It's from God. Breathed out by God. That's why it is divine. <coughs> but how does that mingle with the whole question of its humanity? How does Isaiah get involved? And how come Isaiah did not corrupt? By the way, even if they had perfect memory, by being sinners themselves, because Isaiah was a sinner, Jeremiah was a sinner, Paul was a sinner, they themselves told us that. All right? It's not us saying. They told us that. Paul tells us, for example, in Romans chapter 7, from verse 13 to verse 18, Paul says, the things I want to do, I do not do. But the things I do not want to do, those I find myself doing. And in verse 18, he says, what's wrong with me? And Paul says, I realize, I discover, there is nothing good in me. And in verse 24, he cries out desperately. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? He understands the sin. It is him who in 1 Timothy 1, 15, I quoted this in your hearing yesterday, say, this is a trustworthy saying, and it is worthy of all acceptation, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, and I am the chief of sinners. Yet scripture came through that sin. Why was in scripture contaminated by the sin of Paul? Why, why are we still calling it Holy Bible when it came through sinful men? Isaiah himself tells us in chapter 6 when he was given a glimpse into glory and he sees angels, the seraphims, uh, going around and circling the throne of majesty on high singing in that triumvirate of praise, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the whole earth is filled with his glory. And verse 4 tells us, Isaiah sees his own sinfulness and he says, oh sinful man that I am, a man of unclean lips, I live among unclean men, but my eyes have seen the Lord of glory. Yet scripture comes through Isaiah. How come his sinfulness did not contaminate scripture? I say it is because God, they are going to use a, a difficult word, God superintended the process of transmission of Scripture. God superintended superintended you understand a superintendent in a company the one who oversees who supervises you could even say God supervised the process of transmission of scripture God guarded scripture God made sure that those scripture came through sinful fallible men Yet it was protected from the fallibility and even the sinfulness of those men. Now I want to go to the text that I almost went to earlier on in a Second Peter for this conversation on transmission of scripture. Second Peter. Second Peter. Chapter 1, 2 Peter, chapter 1. Ladies and gentlemen, this is interesting. This is absolutely wonderful. <laughs> ah, very interesting. Let's pick it up.
from verse 19 then. Second Peter. Second Peter. Peter, not Timothy. We dealt with Timothy now. We're dealing with Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 19 to verse 21. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention. You will do well to pay attention. As to a lamb shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Okay, that's good. It's 20 then. Knowing this first of all, knowing this first of all, please get this, knowing this first of all, knowing this, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own private interpretation. Isaiah was not allowed to interpret it the way he thought. Best. No, not at all. For no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Verse 21, for prophecy, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but man spoke from God as they were carried along by who? So there are two questions in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19 to 21. The first is Peter is again emphasizing the origin of scripture. Alright? Which Paul already told us about. He says for no prophecy came by the will of man. It didn't come by the will of Isaiah. Not at all. It was Theonistos. Breathed out by God. But the second thing that Peter tells us is that in fact, a man, a man's interpretation, his thinking, his ideas, his thoughts, about the meaning of scripture does not come into play. So one, the origin of scripture is not the writer, the human writer, okay? But the divine author, who is God. But secondly, even as God gave the word to the human writer, they were not permitted to have their own idea about what has been given. Their own interpretation. Their own feeling. No, they were not permitted that. But thirdly, we are told that this man, this man who wrote scripture, the 40 of them, okay, spoke, wrote as they were, the one is carried along. Carried along. Some of the versions say born. Right? Carried along. When he be born alone, is what he said. Carried along by the Spirit. Now I want to take a few moments to describe this concept of carrying along, right? Or being born of the Spirit. Born. I want to describe that in your hearing for the next few moments and then we will take a break. Carried along by the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? I think what it means, ladies and gentlemen, is that Isaiah, at the time he was receiving God's revelation, or Paul, or Peter, or Amos, they were so overpowered, so overwhelmed, so covered, so dominated 
by the Holy Spirit in such a manner that though their humanity remained, but that humanity was prevented from contaminating scripture. Their thinking remained, their feelings remained, but those feelings were not allowed to contaminate what? Scripture. That's the process we call superintendence. God supervised the process of transmission from God to the writers. There was a process superintended by whom? By the Holy Spirit. From God to the writers, the Holy Spirit guarded the Holy Scripture. The one we use there is that the men were born or carried along. Again, I say the process is a mysterious one. Remember, say it's a mystery how the divine and the human can coexist without violation of either. Now, that concept doesn't concretize in our minds until we look at another scripture. And this scripture this time we find in the Gospel of Luke. Now go to Luke, please. This process by the Holy Spirit, which prevents a holy thing from being contaminated by a sinful humanity. Are you following what I'm saying? It is not just in scripture. We saw it at the conception of Jesus. When the pregnancy of Jesus is being received by Mary. This process happened, and I want you to see it there. Uh, chapter 1 of the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 1 of the Gospel of Luke. <coughs> I'll read verse 30 to 35, alright? Gospel of Luke. Chapter 1. Verses um, 30 to 35. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name, what? Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So Mary gets these super grand promises and she is, uh, in a sense, surprised. How can this happen? I'm still a virgin. I've not known a man. Verse 34, 34, and Mary said to the angel, how will this be, since I am a virgin? Verse 35, this is where we get our our, our issue, our point. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Brothers and sisters, again, one of the problems we have with reading scripture is we never pay attention to what the Bible is saying. Did you see the word therefore there? Did you see the word therefore? What comes before the word therefore? Correct. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, number one. So there will be an activity of God's Spirit in your life, Mary. You be, remember, Mary is asking the question, how can this happen? How can I be the mother of a holy child and I'm a sinful human being? How can that happen? That's the question. How can I be the vehicle of this divine conveyance? How can this be? I know that I'm a sinner from my youth. I'm a descendant of Adam. Forget what the Catholics say, oh Mary uh, is holy. No, Mary wasn't holy. Never. First of all, we are told the Holy Spirit will come upon her. 
But secondly, the power of the Most High shall overshadow. Now, I talk about overwhelm, overpower, dominate. The power of God will dominate men, will overshadow men, will cover men, will overwhelm men. Then we get the word, therefore. Because of those two things, because of the Holy Spirit coming upon you, because of the power of the Almighty overshadowing you, the one who shall be born shall be called holy, the Son of God. The holiness and the Son of God is the result of the coming of the Spirit and the overshadowing work of the Spirit that prevents the holy seed from being contaminated with Mary's sinfulness. Are you following what I'm saying to you? That process is the same process that happened to the writers of Scripture. Peter tells us, holy men of God wrote as they were carried along, born of the Holy Spirit, dominated by the Holy Spirit. They remained sinners, but their product was perfect. Mary remained a sinner, but the product was perfect. <laughs> We say then that the origin of scripture is God, the source of scripture is God, God is perfect, scripture is perfect. Scripture cannot be in error because scripture comes from God. But we were worried that maybe the process of it coming to Isaiah, Paul, Luke, something may have happened. No, Peter tells us, don't worry about that because they wrote as they were born as they were carried by the Holy Spirit, as they were superintended by the Holy Spirit. What then we are saying so far, ladies and gentlemen, is that the source of Scripture is perfect, the transmission of Scripture is perfect. Are we, are we still here? Now, in the second lecture, after this one, I want to deal with the question of verbal versus plenary inspiration of scripture. What is the extent of that inspiration? Is it some parts of the Bible or is it every part of the Bible? Is it just the meaning of the Bible? Or is it the very words and sentences of the Bible? Number say, oh, the meaning is generally okay, but sometimes the history is confusing. No, no, no. That's a question of the extent of inspiration.